All right. Uh, on, the, on the matter of uh, our Negro unit, as it was called, there were a few loose ends there that I wanted to share with you. I, th I think they're significant, both in terms of what we were back then and uh, hopefully what we're on the way to becoming. Uh, in Washington, the Federal Writers Project had uh, Dr. Sterling Brown, an eminent black scholar, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who was the preeminent black scholar. And they were both uh, directing uh, what was called the Negro Affairs Division of the Writers Project. And I recall these communications coming in from Dr. Du Bois to our state white director uh, saying, they were critiquing this stuff that was being sent up, said capitalize Negro. And this was a very big uh, problem with the Writers Project, uh, apparently all over the nation, that uh, the people of the stature of Dr. Du Bois was, were obliged to in, uh, inform and instruct the state directors that a Negro should be capitalized. This was, was a, a biggie. Uh, I recall, too, in Jacksonville, the music project uh, had uh, nationally known composers coming to Jacksonville and they wanted to present them on stage uh, there in, in one of the theaters. And it was discovered that one of the composers was uh, African American. And I remember the correspondence and the furor uh, which arose when uh, final determination was made that there was no way that an African American composer could appear on a platform in a, in a status of uh, equality with the white composers. So that happened. In addition, uh, Madam Mary McLeod Bethune was directing the National uh, Youth uh, Administration, one of the first women and first uh, black women to have a national post of that stature. And it was announced one day that Madam Bethune was coming to Jacksonville. And there was this great cure about how are we going to entertain her. And uh, it was decided that, well, we'll have a buffet affair so that no one will have to serve anyone and no one will have to sit down with anyone, and it will be all buffet. So that's what was done. But they made the mistake of uh, inviting Ms. Bethune to do the invocation or blessing. So what she said was, she got up and, and looked around and said, uh, Dear Lord, why is it we're always behind the door when the good things of life are given out? So <clears throat> that, that was all a part of the picture too back then. I, I wanted to share that with you. In addition, uh, our Florida slave interviews, there were quite a number, some hundreds of surviving uh, slaves, former slaves in the state of Florida. And throughout the South there were a great many. And the Writers Project took it upon uh, ourselves to uh, go out and interview them. And here in Florida, we had enough sense to send uh, African-American uh, staff people to do the interviewing. So we got uh, the quality and the amount of information which we collected in Florida was far superior to the other states where they made the obvious mistake of sending white people to ask blacks how it felt to be a slave. Uh, which reminds me of another one of those anecdotes when, when it was on a South Carolina plantation, the domestic uh, black slave was doing the ironing when the sound of the Yankee guns could be heard coming over the hills. And the mistress said, well, I guess that means you're free. And uh, so the woman put down the iron and the mistress said, you're not going to finish the ironing? And she says, no, ma'am, I'm not going to finish the iron. So the mistress says, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to practice my freedom by sitting down whenever I feel like. <laughs> and uh, I, I think only a slave would, would know that, uh, that that was the real essence and definition of freedom, to be able to sit down whenever you feel like it. And there again, I think, you know, the, the voice of the people, when it gets a chance to speak to a subject like that, can say an awful lot in a few words. Um, some other samples, uh, and I'll uh, get on into the questions with you. When we started traveling around the state uh, with Zora Hurston and other people, 
we started running into various categories of folk tales and folk heroes. I mentioned those in Tampa. And um, there was one, uh, let's see if I can recall it. They, uh, one day, God was on his way to Palatka. And uh, him and St. Peter was hoofing it. And they were so busy toting up in their heads the latest batch of angels that arrived at the pearly gates that they didn't notice the devil lurking up ahead. Uh, but the devil, he noticed them, and uh, he hid behind a stump until they got up real close. And then he jumped out and hollered, Christmas gift! And, of course, that meant God, he done caught God Christmas gift, so God had to give him something. And so God thought about it for a minute. Finally, he looked up and says, take the East Coast. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's, that's, that's how come the Florida East Coast got so many big blows and hurricanes and, and, and mosquitoes and, and so on. It, it belongs to the devil. The uh, question of, of the big blows was everywhere we went, especially in South Florida and East Coast. The uh, one saying was that uh, it was reference to the 1925 hurricane, which was uh, like 200 miles for our velocity. It said, uh, blowed so hard, blowed a well up out of the ground, blowed a crooked road straight, and scattered the days of the week so bad that Sunday didn't get around till late Tuesday morning. <laughs> uh, on down the line, the Miami hurricane, again, the, the 1925 hurricane, uh, there was a black preacher out in the Everglades who survived and made up this song. And I'm sorry I can't sing it for you, but it said, Great God Almighty did move out on the water, and all the peoples in Miami run. Ships swam down that ocean. It was most too sad to tell. 10,000 people got drowned, and all but 12 went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> So here we, we had an example of, of one culture out there in the Everglades cutting cane and passing judgment on the, the Miami folks and, and you know the, their way of life and their chances of getting to heaven. Uh, the West Palm Beach storm uh, took place in 1928, and they made up a song about that. It said the storm met the hurricane. It, 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 two things occurred actually as a matter of history. There was a, a hurricane down around Miami and uh, this so-called storm uh, near a hurricane up in Palm Beach. So the song went, says, the storm met the hurricane in, in West Palm Beach and they sat down and had breakfast together. And the storm said to the hurricane, says, what say we breathe on down to Miami and shake that thing? And <laughs> so these were all having to do with the hurricanes. That same song uh, speaking about the black cane cutters and the glaze being washed away by the thousands. He said, John sends the lady standing in the back door crying, Lord, if I can ever get back to Georgia, I'll never go to Florida no more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see what's left here that I haven't passed on to you. Some more, a few, a uh, handful of uh, folk sayings that uh, I had noted at the time and been carrying around with me ever since. I don't seem to find my note, but uh, one of them, again, is saying a lot in a few words, the black domestic saying, I feed white folks with a long spoon. And another fellow saying, when you, this is again a black, Old timer saying, "When you're in Rome, Georgia, you got to act like it." <laughs> and uh, there again, I think you had the entire scene summed up in, in one sentence. And I let me conclude by just saying, uh, venturing a few opinions uh, about the, the what the whole thing amounted to, the bottom line of the writers' project, and all of the other cultural projects. Um, I think it uh, goes without saying that golden ages in human history, uh, someone has been paying the bill. 
And in ancient history, we had uh, popes and prelates and uh, emperors and merchant princes of Venus and of Venice uh, doing just that, and of course getting uh, what they wanted in terms of uh, art, what they were paying for, and calling the tunes. And it's always seemed to me, uh, not only because of my experience with the Writers Project, but uh, as a matter of uh, commitment or ideology, if you will, that nothing could really be more appropriate to a democracy than the expenditure of some portion of the people's tax monies for the cultural welfare of the people, that surely the, the cultural health of a society is just as important as the sanitation or, or mental health or uh, highway systems and so forth, that uh, the old adage about not living by bread alone certainly applies, that, that this is a, a highly legitimate area, and I've always felt that the the formula arrived at in, in, in our time nowadays of the uh, federal uh, endowment for the arts and the humanities is, is an ideal formula because it, it takes the tax dollars, puts it on the state level, and the state in turn utilizes uh, uh, not bureaucrats but uh, people in, in the arts uh, to make determinations about what popular organizations uh, are to get the money and to spend it for the development of their respective cultures. So that we do have that formula, and I do think it's one we should uh, adhere to and improve upon. And uh, the uh, net result of the cultural projects back in the 30s was considerable. Uh, not only did we get the American Guide series, uh, but uh, from that, there were many spin-offs. Uh, Erskine Colville launched something called the American Folkways series, and all of these were dealing with regionalism, so that the whole school of regionalism in American literature, uh, you, not too much to say in my opinion, had its birth in these programs. And uh, in addition to the Folkways series edited by Colville, there was the Rivers of America series and Botkin's uh, Treasuries of American Folk Song, and su Southern Treasury, and Midwestern, and so forth. And as Gary again mentioned, uh, such writers as Stud Sturkle, and Richard Wright, and Maradella Sewer, and any number of Harnett Kane, any number of talents uh, came to birth uh, as a result of, and thanks to the Federal Writers Project. So I think it was very much a worthwhile endeavor, and. Uh, I will conclude my remarks, uh, except for your questions and answers, by a final uh, bit of folk say. Uh, some old timer, I don't know what uh, color he was, but what he said was, if you ain't got no education, you got to use your brain. <laughs> As something of, of an old timer myself, I would add to that, uh, that, that we need to use, no matter how much education we get, uh, we, we need to use not only our brains, but our hearts. And I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> uh, and your questions, or discussions, or arguments. <laughs> Welcome arguments, yes. Oh, uh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> uh, you know, I have a, a correspondent in the person of none other than the Grand Dragon of Florida, uh, John Baumgartner, who lives up in McIntosh now. And John Baumgartner, uh, in addition to being Grand Dragon, was the editor of the newspaper The Klansman for a long time. And he challenged me, he uh, wanted to interview me for The Klansman. And I said, well, let's uh, uh, let me interview you and you interview me if you promise to print every word, you know, that uh, we'll print everything that's said. So he agreed and proceeded to publish this uh, unlikely encounter, I suggested he call it, in The Klansman. And uh, since that time, he's been writing me about how I had converted him from white supremacy <laughs> he, he now believes only in voluntary uh, segregation. Uh, by that, he, he would 
like it most of all if, if all African Americans would go back to Africa, as the, as the Klan says. Uh, John is at the same time as, uh, serving as self-appointed mentor to the militias. And of course we have any number of those in Florida as well as elsewhere in the country. And it's my opinion that the militias are a far greater threat in terms of uh, race war and ethnic cleansing than anything the Klan ever posed in the past. That uh, in the vacuum of any ideological leadership for the militias, they, they're anti-government and they're, they're just anti-congenitally, uh, and they like to play around with guns and bloodthirsty, uh, macho. Uh, in the absence of any ideological leadership, the Klan types have stepped in and telling them that the thing to do is to get all the blacks back into Africa, uh, to overthrow the government, uh, to forget the Constitution and have a, a republic of whites only. Uh, blacks, Hispanics, uh, all uh, non-Aryans, as they call it, uh, relegated not to second-class citizenship as in the recent past, but to non-citizenship. They would not have any rights. And uh, tacked on to all of that, they are uh, talking about the abolition of the United Nations and a global holocaust this time. And these fellows are, are there are just enough of them in there who are completely in, insane on the subject uh, to keep on doing the sort of thing we've seen at Oklahoma City and the FBI Communication Center and the Amtrak train. In my opinion, those are not uh, uh, passing you know, you know, flukes. Uh, they're a harbinger of things to come because these people are out there, they're training. I've been saying to other audiences, you can imagine if, if African Americans or, or Hispanic Americans were out in the woods uh, training with automatic weapons, uh, how long it would last. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. These, these are, uh, you know, the hangover from the, the days when the Klan was saying it's a white man's country and white men should rule. And there's, these people are still thinking that way. Yes. I feel pretty sad about uh, that state of condition you were talking about. So I looked around to see who was uh, an antidote to it, and, uh, and it turned out to be a Southern Poverty <laughs> Institute, I think you call it. It's a law office up in Alabama. Yes, that's right, Montgomery. Uh, Montgomery are putting out a uh, Klan watch, but they have more, they said, I subscribe or whatever, and uh, con contributed. Uh, but they put, they list these uh, prejudice groups and they list what they're doing to it. And that one law, law, law office is the one that put Klan out of business and, and uh, legal out of business in Alabama, Georgia, and uh, none of went to Oregon, so anyway, they're going to feel a little happier. That's the organization that gets yeah. information. Yes. That Southern Poverty Law Center hit upon a device of uh, uh, suing the Klan, going, taking them into court. And any time you file suit, you, of course, are entitled to taking depositions under oath and uh, 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 disclosure procedures of uh, warrants from materials and documents. And this procedure has been so successful in Alabama, especially, as you say, getting major judgments. Uh, that particular clan, uh, the mother of a, a black youth who was uh, lynched, uh, got a judgment. The clan said it didn't have any money, so they gave her their imperial palace, so-called. <laughs> so-called, which I think a frame building, but they call it their imperial palace. And uh, so this, this sort of thing can be very effective. It wasn't, uh, I didn't push it in my day because the very idea of uh, African Americans or anyone representing African Americans going into court and suing white folks was just just unthinkable. I mean, just you couldn't do it, and it's just uh, a possibility that is opened up. Uh, one of the things I did do was take note of the fact that the federal government, when it couldn't pin anything on Al Capone or some of the other uh, gangster or mafia people, would get them on income tax charges and put them behind bars. So I said to myself, well, these uh, hate mongers and, and race racketeers uh, are making money too and uh, doing it illegally, the outlaw activities, uh, extra legal, outside the law. 
and I've been urging upon uh, administrations uh, ever since the uh, 40s, since Truman, to uh, levy taxes against all of these groups. And occasionally it, it's worked. Uh, Roosevelt, during the war, put the Klan out of business for the duration of the war by sending the IRS around and tacked a notice on the Imperial Palace that it owed Uncle Sam $600,000. And I interviewed the uh, Imperial Wizard in Miami shortly afterward. He had boarded up the palace and uh, the plywood and moved, retired to Miami. And he says, 600000 says, what, what else could I do, you know? Uh, who's got 600000 So. It was a very effective way of shutting down the Klan for the duration of the war. Yes? I have one question about the uh, WCA. It was still racist, but now I have two. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is, it's just amazing to me that uh, today we hear a couple more about uh, the government uh, sponsoring art projects, getting a under attack by people like Senator Allen and Rush Limbaugh. Way back in the 1930s, we yeah. had the government uh, sponsoring these uh, art projects. Yeah. I'm even more surprised that, that black Americans would be included in that project. So that is one question I have. Mm -hmm. The second one is uh, most of the people I know, African American, uh, think O.J. Simpson is fairly irrelevant. And we are amazed at the obsession of the media. And I must say, a good many white people who follow the media, but O.J. Simpson, and so neglectful of these dangerous groups that you're talking about around the country. What is it going to take to make people stop focusing on something like that, which is almost irrelevant, and focus on this real danger all around us? That's the question confronting America. You know, it's not just uh, here in this room. It's, it's the question before the House, uh, the American House. And uh, I'm not at all certain. I've spent my life thinking about it, uh, looking at it, uh, studying on it, and acting on it. But I'm not sure I know, uh, you know, a single answer. Uh, it's, uh, it probably doesn't have a single answer. Uh, what have I been saying on the subject? Uh, for one thing, uh, you know, this talk in, in church circles and uh, any other circles, governmental circles, academic circles about uh, Brotherhood Week, and uh, if we don't need Brotherhood Week, we've got to find a way to have Brotherhood uh, around the calendar. And uh, that's, that's the size of the problem, that these other uh, efforts are all to the good, I suppose, but uh, my contention is that you can't build that kind of thing, brotherhood or uh, cultural equality, on foundations of uh, economic or social or political inequality. And we're going to have uh, justice has got to be across the board. It's indivisible. And we got, that means we're talking about a different kind of society. That is a more just, equitable uh, opportunities on the basis of equality. And uh, that's the size of the order as I see it. Uh, uh, education. I remember back in the 30s, uh, whenever anybody wanted to change things for the better, somebody would say, well, Prejudice is a matter of the heart, and there's no use uh, legislating or passing laws. The laws will have no effect that you're going to have to educate prejudice out of people. And for the most part, the people saying that didn't want any change. Uh, and they knew that was slow motion. Uh, we've had religions on the planet for a long time, preaching brotherhood. And they kill each other in wartime uh, without any regard to it even if they're the same religion, much less different. And uh, so that that has not been the solution, in my opinion. And I would argue even back then that uh, the experience of living together and studying together and working together and playing together on a basis of equality was the most efficacious educational process possible. And that we could legislate about equal access to a workplace and uh, universities and schools and all these other things. So that uh, uh, I was a great believer then, and still am, in, in the, the legislation. I think not only uh, in terms of a nation, but internationally, uh, 
the answer to your question might lie in the direction of we're going to have to legislate it and then enforce it. Then anybody's disturbing the peace within the nation in terms of race and religion or anybody in the international scene who's disturbing the peace and trying to ethnic cleanse their neighbors or the na nation next door, which something's got to be a power to stop it. And uh, if that happened, of course, uh, the Roman Empire had a peace of sorts. Uh, all the barbarians, as they called them, were, had been fighting each other. The Romans said, we want you to cut it out and work for us. Uh, you know, and uh, some other dictators since then have, have said the same thing. Cut out the fighting and get to work. But there has to be a way of doing it uh, for dem democracy to do it without dictatorship. And that's, again, I think part of the answer. But I didn't hear the, if there was a different question. In the first part of your question I may have missed. Roosevelt hasn't, he's gotten a lot of credit, but he, he's deserving far more even than he's gotten, in my opinion. When the man died, everybody cried, and with good reason. And that was one of the reasons. He was putting people like Mary McLeod Bethune uh, in charge of an, a national project, and this was something that had never happened in American history, and hasn't much happened since, uh, to the same extent. So he was the first man to put not only African Americans, but, but women into high office. Uh, very many of these cultural projects, uh, the great majority of them, the state directors were women. Uh, uh, you know, it was a mixed bag. Uh, I, I told you about the, the Negro unit and its 10 slots and how they cut even those. Um, but uh, I remember W.T. Couch, the director of the Chapel Hill University of North Carolina Press, was regional director for the Writers Project at that time. And Dr. Dubois in Washington, Sterling Brown, were pressuring him about hiring an African American for his regional office. And he came up with this old answer of, I would if I could, and, you know, if I could just find one, a qualified one. And uh, so they were, that, that answer was born way back. Um, Couch uh, and I got into a polemic by mail. Uh, he, I wanted to write in my Southern Exposure book uh, about, uh, I have a chapter called Total Equality and how to get it. So I was thinking about this, your question back then in 46. Uh, Couch said uh, that I had to make up my mind whether or not I believed in majority rule. And if I did, then I'd have to concede to the white South the right to segregate. And of course, uh, he was very far off base. Uh, there was no such thing as Confederate States. Uh, the South was not a body politic. We were in counties and cities and states. And uh, uh, this whole concept of trying to justify apartheid in terms of uh, a democratic right of a white majority. So I took exception to that, and he even raised the question, we have to, first of all, if you decide that segregation is wrong, and my answer to that was, well, it's obviously wrong, you know, no use, no use arguing that one. If, if blacks were doing the segregating, he'd, he'd get the point. If it's a question of who's segregating whom. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about editing, local editing and state editing. Uh, in my estimation, Roosevelt's time was very liberal for, that, for those days, and Florida politics was very rightist uh, for, those, uh, for today's time even. Uh, and uh, you mentioned about continuing some, a similar project now. Who would do the hiring and who would do the censorship on the final script? Uh, they I don't know. It's it's for, uh, the the broader question of democracy. If uh, we say we have a democracy, uh, sometimes I'm not so sure. 
and the cost of elections, for example, uh, an ordinary person can't run for public office without money from somebody, big money. And uh, I'm concerned somewhat about the, the, the media and, and academia as well, I must confess. Uh, the state of the public mind, the ability of, to uh, control and direct and manipulate the public mind. Uh, I uh, was at the FSU some time ago, and Russell Means, the leader of the American Indian Movement, was there. And he got up, and the first thing he said was, here in this great citadel of white brainwashing. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, it struck a chord with me. And uh, I said, I was speaking at the University of Colorado uh, recently, and the question of free speech came up. I said, yeah, well, so you've got free speech, but what have you got to say? <laughs> and uh, uh, the student body didn't know what to say, you know. So I think there's probably a point there that uh, one reason we have free speech is that we've been fixed uh, to not be able to say anything of, of any consequence, except what we've already heard and been taught Yeah. Stetson, would you uh, elaborate a little bit about some of your experiences in the field in Florida in the 1930s, especially carrying around that, those early recording machines, particularly I know the, with uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston and, and your Robert Cook, I think, uh, but how you recorded uh, some of these early interviews and the dangers that turpentine camps, et cetera. Yeah, it reminds me, before I answer your question, I don't know why it reminded me of, I wanted to tell you about, we said we used African Americans to interview African Americans, uh, thinking that was the way to get straight dope. Uh, so there wandered into our state office one day, uh, uh, some kind of Yankee Indian, uh, I, don't, uh, I forget what he was, Oswego or something. Anyway, he had a PhD from New England. <laughs> and uh, no job, and he wanted the, one of those 37, 50 jobs. So we said, well, maybe the Seminoles down in the glades will talk to this fellow, tell him things uh, that they won't tell us. So we hired him and sent him into the glades. And I don't think we ever heard from him. <laughs> <laughs> so th things like that. You know. Uh, your question about the, the techniques, the machine, and so on, uh, these were the days, uh, well, the machine was the size of uh, almost half of this table here and required two people to carry it, uh, uh, strong people. And it cut uh, directly onto acetate 16-inch discs, and you could play it back immediately. And that was what we had. Zora borrowed it uh, on the strength of her books and, and Franz Boyle's uh, recommendation uh, borrowed the machine from the Library of Congress and, and sent it to Florida. And we traveled around the state with that thing uh, using two automobile batteries when there was no electricity, which was frequently the case. And we'd take it out on the railroad tracks and the pokey fishing boats and so forth. And uh, I recall the first day out with it, uh, I took it over to the same soup kitchen I was talking about in Jacksonville where the Negro unit was housed. And uh, the people, the patrons of the soup kitchen were having a religious ceremony and singing spirituals. And I recall one of the spirituals was, Lord, I'm running, trying to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half won't do. <laughs> and uh, we were recording this, and I said to myself, well, I'll just play it back. So that we found that the technique of immediate playback after the first few lines whoever was involved would hear their voices and really get excited, and from then on, you couldn't stop them, you know? And <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was a great icebreaker in terms of uh, that. So uh, we had no sooner started in the first playback of the spiritual, and the woman in charge, uh, a very important woman of the stature almost of Mary McLeod Bethune, Eartha White, stood up and threw up her hand and said, stop it right there. I said, uh, I'm going to have a little prayer. And she said, Dear Lord, said, this is Eartha White talking to you again. <laughs> I said, just want to thank you. If 
for, for giving mankind the intelligence to make such a, invent such a marvelous machine and for giving us a president like Franklin D. Roosevelt who cares about the songs people sing. And that was, that was her little prayer. And we, we carried the machine all over Florida. We must have collected, uh, we, the press referred to it as canned folk songs. And we canned about 5,000 at least Florida folk items and sent them to the Library of Congress. And there they stayed for some decades. And this past decade, I suggested to our Florida Folk Life Program to, that those things ought to be brought back home. So they paid, somebody paid uh, for cassettes to be made from the records. And those cassettes are now over in Tallahassee in, in the Division of Cultural Affairs. And they're available to teachers and professors at a cost, cost basis. Uh, I recall another thing I didn't tell you. I thought that uh, John Lomax, Allen's father, had pioneered folklore collecting before I came along. <clears throat> and they had pretty much emptied, uh, preempted the field for all of the John Henry, the classics. So I was hard put, and I wanted to get something different and new. So I, when they'd finished everything else, I'd say, well, do you know any dirty songs? <laughs> <laughs> generally, usually they knew plenty of dirty songs. And sometimes the men would say, well, I can't sing them well, they're women. You have to get rid of the women first. And so we got rid of the women and scheduled a special all-male session the next morning in the AME church. And at 8 o'clock, all the windows were filled with women's heads looking, <laughs> <laughs> looking at the windows. So, <laughs> He, they sang anyway, you know, <laughs> women say. And Zora was involved in, in some of that. I'll, I'll tell you about Zora in another session. I think it's a, not the next session, but our third session. That I'm going to be talking about Zora Hurston and uh, Marjorie Rawlings and Hemingway and Theodore Pratt and other Florida writers that I, I work, knew, worked with. Um, yeah, that covered. <laughs> Yes. I, I was impressed with that you had actually interviewed ex slaves, uh, visited with ex slaves. Uh, the impression I have is that you did not look so far away from the situation as well. Slaves in Florida? Yes. There, was, uh, there were plantations of both cotton and tobacco to a degree in the panhandle uh, in central Florida, the north part there, Madison and uh, Monticello and so forth. And uh, there were some slaves, yes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, some of you historians look it up. <laughs> uh, I read somewhere that uh, there were more slaves in Florida at the, upon the declaration of uh, the Civil War than there were white people. Uh, does that sound familiar at all? The, well, my source said more blacks, but uh, it may have been close. In any case, they, they were here, no question about that. Uh, I remember when my book, uh, Palmetto Country, came out, uh, my aunt Lizzie said, well, we, we can't, I, I said almost nothing, you know, I say almost nothing much as the law was uh, African-American, but I hadn't, uh, you know, ground any axes or had a whole lot to say about human rights in my first book. <laughs> Uh, but just enough to get, it, it, it had a reaction, including my Aunt Lizzie, who said, well, we can't expect Stetson to understand the South because he was born in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> when when, when she, she says understand the South, of course, she meant the black question as she saw it. Okay. Uh, we need to, to end this one here because there is... Ah. I more of us that's enough for the next, next time, you understand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, this is a time for a small commercial also, for those of you who would like to have a book, you'd be glad to sign uh -huh. it, am I right? Do we have copies? In the okay. library or the other, other end of the other We are truly uh, thankful for your honoring us to be here by today. Mm -hmm. Remember us during the next times, and I want to thank the president for allowing us to come into her house, and my colleague for, for taking her weekend off to come and help us videotape this one. Thank you very much. Thank you.